next thing I want to talk about has to do a little bit with checking the piece of equipment to make sure it's going to work do stuff for you safely so we're going to it's a little thing I call uh, RDT reducing downtime and then you know we talked about important that you understand when the chain is sharp and dull you also need to understand definitely as a chain operator when you pick it up and start it is it running correctly and uh, so a little check we'll go through on that but the first thing is uh you know and I would put these up here uh, first thing on reducing downtime is to, to make sure we think through the safety features on the saw. There's a, next thing is making sure the air filter is clean. As an operator, that might be one of the things that you're responsible for, or at least you need to check it and make sure that somebody at the shop's taking care of it, because that's going to affect the total run of it. And you know, if it starts slowing down or if it's speeding up too much, then you got problems there. Number three is a visual open. That's probably the first thing we do. Making sure that you got uh, uh, you know gas and oil and proper mix and those kinds of things in it ready to go. But then looking over, make sure there's no missing screws or loose handles, those kinds of things. Leaks. Number four is starter. If you don't check out the starter rope before you go halfway across county, you can end up with it coming off and then you gotta make a back trip. But uh, you can't push starter chainsaw. So you, you've gotta have the rope functioning, the starter system. And then the last is the bar chain and sprocket. And that's, that's really the, the working side of everything. And so we wanna make sure that, that that's in good shape. So I wanna run down through here just a little bit of, of what we check and, and why we check on that. And also probably in a storm situation, you're gonna to have to uh, put another chain on the bar or, or whatever. So adjustment of that and getting that all ready. But the first thing that uh, I want us to take a look at has to do with the the three safety features. The first one is back here on the back. This is called the throttle interlock. And it's on there because your hand needs to be in the driver's seat here to be able to accelerate the saw. If I set it down or I turn around, the stick goes up in here, it can go wide open if that interlock's not on there. And so you gotta depress that for it to go. Uh, next one is, is down here on the bottom. And, and this is the chain catch or chain stop. And it's usually out of plastic or aluminum. It's something that's soft so it doesn't booger your chain up too bad. But if you operate a chainsaw long enough, you're going to have a chain jump off the bar. Mm -hmm. And when it does, that little tab stops the rotation and shortens the distance back up to the operator. So you want to make sure you keep a check on that, that it's on there, especially if you're cutting a lot of brush and debris. And then the third thing that has to be on every saw, and that, that is a chain a hand guard up here. It doesn't have to have a chain break to it, but it has to have a hand guard on top of the saw. Mm -hmm. Then the B175 standard basically gives the manufacturers a little option. Uh, they have to have the hand guard, but then they can also, to combat uh, reactive forces we talked about, is a chain brake assembly or a guard tip. They can mount a guard tip on here. It basically covers the kickback corner of the bar. The only thing it does do though, it limits the diameter of what you can cut. If you're cutting a lot of brush or this way even, you, you get stuck, you can't pull straight back out. You gotta go this way or this way to be able to clear it. If you're cutting down through it, you can't pull straight out. You gotta come up or down, and sometimes that can cause some issues. So manufacturers like Husqvarna and Steel, they decided to go with the chain brake assembly. And how that works is that it's set, so if it kicks within 45 degrees of the operator, your wrist hits the handle, basically triggers the brake, stops the momentum. And so that's how it works. But actually, they go another step. They have a, what's called an inertia activation. And what that means is if I'm cutting this way, my hand's not going to hit it. It, it basically, the, just the jerk of the kickback actually triggers the, the, the chain brake. So here you can see the chain, and if I just drop it, it actually triggers that brake forward. So whatever position I'm in, if it kicks hard enough, hopefully that, that uh, inertia activation grabs it. So that's an important thing to think about. I don't, I don't consider it so much from the standpoint of kickback, but reactive forces. The chain brake I use a lot like a parking brake. In other words, when I get ready to go to work with the saw, I take the brake off, I can start to cut. If I get ready to take a hand off or do something, I can put the brake on. And so it kind of puts it in park. If I'm starting the chainsaw, put the brake on. So it just gives you quite a lot of advantage. Uh, walking around with a saw and stuff like that, you're not going to trip and fall on a moving chain. So that's uh, one advantage there. Another safety feature that's, that's out there is the AB system. Uh, that isolates a lot of the, the vibrations and stuff from the operator and the handles. There's also reduced kickback saw chain. 
and guide bar tips being smaller that reduce that kickback area we talked about. So all of those are safety features that are put into most of today's saws. So that's kind of at least those three you want to make sure is a, in, a, in a good position. Air filter. Every bit of air that goes into this engine to run goes through what I call the chainsaw nose. Um, this is the air filter system. And so this one has just a standard nylon mesh on it. Some of them have a, what they call a flock filter, which is like door or window screen. It's got material woven into it. You've got some of them that are uh, pressed fibers. You've got some that are uh, paper elements. There are different ones. There's pre-filters. Some of them have saws filter at the flywheel too. So there's, there's different issues to help cut down the amount of dirt that's going to go into the engine. What you have to recognize as an operator is there's a lot of air volume there. And so you got to keep somewhat of a regular check. When that filter starts clogging up, your engine's going to start running richer. It starts smoking, it starts stopping up exhaust systems, fouling out spark plugs, all that kinds of stuff. And uh, years ago, I was coming back from Chicago from a training class, and I got onto the plane, and, and uh, more or less there was a magazine rack. And at that time, I was kind of trying to be healthy. I was running a little bit. And, uh, I went in there and I saw it said Runner's World, so I grabbed a magazine and I went back and I've used the story in there for years. Because what it was, it was a, a story about the difference between a car and a human. And they said the average person had about 400 cc's of lung capacity, they only used about a fourth of it, so about 100 cc's. You sit around like today, it's about 16, 17 breaths a minute. If you go out running, you may go up to 50 to 52, it said. And I checked it, it was pretty close. You start thinking through it, I don't remember what the cars were, but how much air volume goes through a saw. And the average selling saw, number one selling saw, is about 50 to 51 cc's, three cubic inch. So you take 50, that's a half of the average breath we take, but how many breaths a minute does it take? Every time that piston goes up and down, the crankshaft goes around one RPM. They idle at about 3,000 RPM. They're in and out of the curve, probably wide open, 10,000 RPM. So you take 10,000 times 50, 500,000 cc's. That thing uses more air in one minute than we do in probably two and a half, three hours of running. And you know what happens if your head stops up? You start getting loss of power. And so it's so important that we keep that filter clean so that air can go through. And that's the big ticket there. To, some of them you tap them off, some of them like the pressed air, some of them warm soap and water, let them dry. There's different things that you check in the manuals to be able to make sure that it's there. And some of them have to be replaced on a regular basis. Third thing, visual over. What should you do if you pick up a piece of equipment, handheld equipment anyway, out of the truck bed or you pick it up out of the shop and you notice there's a puddle of fuel under it? What should you do with it? Find out where it's coming from. Find out where it's coming from. Tag it out. Don't use it. A handheld piece of equipment, if it's dripping fuel and you start moving around, it's going to make it to the exhaust. It's going to light up. So you want to make sure that you look for any kind of leaks and stuff. Uh, bar oil is, is going to burn, but it's not going to flash up with you. But if it's fuel mix, you want to make sure that you get it fixed before you pull the rope. Get it, get it, uh, get it repaired. It could be a cap, it could be a line, whatever it might be. Make sure that that's done. And then also, you want to take a look at any loose screws or missing screws, cracked handles, those kinds of things, uh, switches that are working. All of this kind of stuff is under that visual check over. Starter system. Just turn off your your switch, and you should have about 30 inches of rope, no frays or tears. Uh, it should have good paw grab and it should go all the way back in and spring hold it in. It should be flopping around on the side. So you want to make sure that starter is ready to go before you go across county. And then the big thing, number five, the chain bar and sprocket. And this is something that I see quite often is uh, people having to change out the chains or cleaning the saw or whatever. And oftentimes I see people, they'll, they'll take a side nut or nuts off of it and then they say, well, Got to get this side cover off. It won't. It won't come off. So they start prying and they start pulling. And on the small husvarnas, mid-range husvarnas, small steels, a lot of them have external mounted chain brake assembly. And so if I disengage that brake, it'll come off. The band is in the outside cover. So you always want to think about disengaging that brake before you start trying to take the side plate off of it. Okay. Some of them are kind of hard to reset if you don't. Uh, unset it before it goes off the bed. And so you want to make sure that, that that band is in good shape. But the other thing that I see quite often is people don't understand, even with the side cover on, you start it up and they forget about the brake. You hit the throttle, it starts to make more noise, but you look down, the chain's not turning. 
And I see people all the time, why, 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 what's wrong with this thing, why? Well, this is that centrifugal clutch I talked about earlier. Drum here is attached to the gear, the sprocket on the backside. So if you hit the gas, these shoes are slinging out, but if it has a band holding it down, it can't move, or it's stuck in a limb or a log and can't turn, you rev the engine, it takes about 30 seconds, and that thing will glow red hot. It gets hot quick. You'll see it starts smoking. If you look at it, it gets red hot. So you want to think about any time you hit the throttle and the chain doesn't turn, you need to find out what the issue is. If you can melt down the side of the saw, and it's really kind of dangerous too when you get stuck in something. If you're revving it when you pull it out, if you happen to pull out enough and hit the tip, now it can rotate on you. If it pulls throttle, it can have quite a lot of movement. So you want to make sure that the chain doesn't turn, let off the throttle. Okay? Then the next thing is, I want to check the sprockets and uh, just take a look at those. There's two sprockets, one that's on the crankshaft. And if you see that it has wear, about the thickness of your thumbnail, let's say about 28 thousandths of an inch, they can't harden the sprocket all the way to the middle or it'd be brittle. So once it wears through that outer 20, 28 thousandths of an inch, it starts to drop in and you end up with real fast wear. So you kind of keep an idea on that. And then the other one is the sprocket here on the tip. If they get real pinpointed, it's, it's dull. Or not dull, but it's worn. If it should be dull here on the end, kind of squared off or rounded off, and it should spin freely, but still it should be tight. A lot of the bars will have a grease or an oil hole. It's not that necessary that you grease it there. It's kind of for an assembly process. But a uh, good bar and chain oil, keeping the rails clean, that'll take care of the situation. But uh, steel took them out years ago. They're not necessary as far as oiling or greasing that particular bearing. Then the uh, next thing is, is that uh, these, these chains and bars run at an average of about 450 degrees. If you put cookies in an oven at 450 degrees and leave them for a week, what would they look like? Carbon. Same thing here. If it's sitting there at 450 degrees, it's cooking the chips and the oil in there. So daily, you need to make sure that you keep that cleaned out so the oil hole is clear, so the oil goes through it and not, doesn't go around it and drip around. The other thing that starts to happen is a flaring or a flashing, I call it peening that happens. You can use a flat file to take it off, and that's one reason why if you start messing with bars and chain, both of them are sharp. The edges are sharp too, so you want to make sure that you keep gloves on them. They'll slice and dice you like a 2 o'clock infomercial. But uh, here you've got a bar dresser also that can be used for a flat file to take it off, clean the rails, and you can also rotate the bar to be able to even out the wear on top and bottom. Okay? Then going back on it, and this is something I, I see so many times people try to do it the hard way. They try to put the chain onto the bar and then they set the saw up like this and it takes like three or four hands trying to get everything in position. If you just set your saw, whether it's steel or most one, set it on the bottom, okay? Take your chain, set it aside. Take your bar, set the bar onto the studs. And it'll go on and just sit there on any of them. And, uh, then you look at your chain, your five parts of the tooth, the depth gauge should be forward to the point on top, and that should go forward, right? If you turn it this way, it'll stand the trees back up. <laughs> if you don't believe me, just try it. You'll think they're standing back up. And then you go around that drum and into the sprocket, and you lay the chain into the rail, top rail of the saw, okay, the bar. Then you push back on it, go around the tip, and then grab with a gloved hand, just pull, it goes right up onto the adjuster. You can pretty much do it one-handed. Your adjuster on the Husqvarna is on the outer cover. Your steels have it on the crankcase side. And so here, we want to probably have to back it up just a little bit. My adjuster screw is here on the left. I just pull it back so it goes into the adjuster hole. Now I want to start the nut or nuts on there just till they're thumb tight. Once I've got them thumb tight, then I need to adjust the chain. You don't want to leave the chain loose down below the bar because when it starts to cut, it's going to bunch up, okay? So what you want to do is you want to adjust that until the chain just touches the rails. And some people say you don't want to pull more than about three links out. It really is hard to say according to the bar length that you have what's going to be able to pull out. But if it just pulls out, snaps back in, still turns freely around, that's a good adjustment. And what causes this thing to loosen up? In other words, I see sometimes people want to put an extension on or step on a wrench or whatever to tighten those things down. That's not necessary. This is aluminum or magnesium. When you snug it down, it's going to hold it tight. And actually, it's going to probably expand a little bit and even tighten it. If I go back and start to check in an hour or two, it's going to be tighter than when I left it. And so as I heat up the engine, it actually tightens it up. And people say, well, I don't think mine stays tight because my chain keeps loosening up. You know what causes it to loosen? Heat. 
And so if you have a chain that keeps loosening up, it's probably because of the five parts of the big tooth we talked about. If you're running dull chain, that temperature could go from 450 up to close to 1,000 degrees. And so that metal expands, some of it contracts back, but eventually the wear of it is not going to. So the first thing to make sure is you have good, sharp chain. I had one guy in class one time just about years ago in West Virginia, and he, he said, I don't think my oiler's working on my chainsaw because it, it smokes like crazy. A guy sitting over in the corner, he said, metal don't smoke. I said, what'd you say? He said, well, metal don't smoke. Come find out, he was a welder, machine shop, and stuff like that for the state. And uh, he went on to explain, he said, metal doesn't smoke. If it's smoking, it's got paint or oil that's burning off of it. So if your oiler, you think your oiler's not working and it's smoking, it's probably burning paint off, but it's probably oil that's burning off. So it's probably oiling, it's just you got it too hot. What's causing it to get too hot? I've got a dull chain and I'm pushing against these rails and I'm taking it up to 700, 800, or 1,000 degrees. So I've got to think about keeping it sharp so that reduces the temperature and allows my oil to take care of the lubrication. Okay. So that's kind of the bar chain and sprocket. Looking at the starter system, the uh, visual over, looking at the uh, air filter and then the chain, I mean uh, the uh, safety features on the saw. So all of those things are, are part of the check we do. And I tell you, you can, you can sharpen, clean it up, and probably be able to uh, check all those things in a lot less than 10 minutes. And all you gotta do is just think about those five areas and, and check them on the saw. Then after that, start it up to see, see how it's gonna run. And uh, I'll go ahead and give you those two. This is kind of the, the system I go through. First of all, you gotta make sure the air filter is clean off of this side. Mm -hmm. Because the air filter's not clean, it's not gonna adjust out properly. Then you start it up and let it warm up. Now, this is a different checklist that we won't start. This is a saw that's, that's runnable and uh, it checks out technically. So you start it up and let it warm up. Then what we want to do is we want to go to high speed, wide open throttle. And we listen for what we call a flutter. It's kind of a wide open, it comes up and levels out. And um, a lot of times manufacturers say it's a good idea to have a tachometer to check it, and it is. If you're, if you're checking a lot of saws, that will tell you whether they're over the design parameters very quickly. Like this one, no load speed's 12,000 RPM max, okay? But a tachometer will only tell you when it's in adjustment. It won't necessarily tell you when it's out. You could set this saw to 12,000 and then have bad fuel or air leak or something come about, and the flutter goes away, and you can still take it down. So you want to make sure that you have that flutter as an operator. When you go wide open, it shouldn't sound like it's running out of gas, continue up till it dies off. It should come up and level out at that point. I'll let you hear that this afternoon. Then these three, all of this is checked at idle. The first thing is on any chainsaw you're operating, you never want to operate a saw where you let off the throttle, that centrifugal clutch doesn't disengage. That means your chain's going to be creeping or spinning around. So. When you let off the throttle, the chain should be stopped completely without putting a brake on. That chain turning around is with that centrifugal clutch. So what you need to do is you need to slow it down. That's the T or the LA screw. All that does is just open and close the throttle trigger. And so you slow down the RPM until that clutch disengages. Then number four, it should run in all positions, basically till it runs out of fuel. So it should sit there and idle. You should be able to roll it over, move it around without it going dead. If it's too rich, it's probably going to puff smoke and die. So you want to think about the adjustments for that. And then the last one is it accelerates back up to wide open throttle without any hesitation. And that's the five steps. In other words, what I do is I make sure my air filter is clean. I put my brake on. I start it up. I let it warm up. I take the brake off. I go wide open. Comes up. Levels out. Once it does that, let off the throttle. My chain should stop turning. I put the brake back on, I roll it around, make sure it idles with no RPM change. Take the brake back off, hit it, it should go back up with no hesitation. If it does that, that dog's ready to hunt, just that simple. But if it doesn't do one of those fives, you need to find somebody who adjusts. Now, a lot of times you want to start going over this, people say, I don't want people to have a screwdriver, and I don't disagree with that. I don't think everybody needs to have one. But everybody that picks up a chainsaw needs to know when it's running right and when it's wrong. I, I feel myself, I see a lot more saws blown up from lack of adjustment than I do adjustment. Mm -hmm. So if I give you a saw, Jerry, and I say, I want you to go out there and cut that stump down. If you get it started, you're going to do what? You're going to cut the stump. Mm -hmm. 
But if that saw is screaming too le too lean or, or it's not running right and you keep cutting, it's gonna probably go down. And when it does, it blows up, then you still gonna get blamed for it, aren't you? Mm -hmm. So the best thing to do is know as an operator, this thing's running too rich or it's running too lean or it won't idle or the chain's spinning around all the time. And then you take it to somebody who drives a screwdriver. You don't have to have one to adjust it yourself, do you? So when we start to look, this is a, a quick, quick step. And I, I want to kind of run through this just a little bit so you kind of understand on two cycles. When I pull the rope, that piston goes up and down. When the piston goes up, it creates a negative pressure in the crankcase on a two cycle. That means when it creates negative, it's just like sucking on a straw. It pulls air through the filter. Then it squishes it down as it goes through the carburetor throat. Okay. So the speed of the air gets a little bit faster. In the carburetor, it's sprayed with fuel. Where does the two cycle engine get its lubrication? Fuel. You through the fuel. You mix your gas and oil together. Mm -hmm. So then it goes through the carburetor, spray with oil. Now that air and fuel mix goes into the crankcase. The reason why it goes through the crankcase first is because that's how it lubricates. It doesn't have a quart of oil or six quarts mm -hmm. of oil down there like your car or your lawnmower. It has nothing down there. So you've got to take the lubrication in there with the fuel mix. Mm -hmm. So that, that lubricates your wrist pin, rod bearing, seals, all that kind of stuff. Then the piston goes down, it pushes it up this port and into the combustion area, okay? So picture this, it goes up, creates a vacuum, pulls it in the bottom. Piston goes down, pushes it up to the top. Now the piston comes back up, it's doing what? It's filling this up, and just before top dead center, the spark plug explodes, and more or less then it squashes and pushes all the burn gases out through the exhaust. It all happens in two strokes. That's where that flutter sound is a timing of everything going in, being burned, and going out. And that's what you're listening for as an operator. So the H screw, if I turn it to the right, takes away fuel. If I turn it to the left, it adds fuel. That's the high speed. Wide open is the only place that screw works. Then the L screw is at these two here. If I turn it to the right, it takes away fuel. Turn it to the left, it adds fuel. So if it sits there and I let it sit and it idle and I pick it up, it goes dead, I probably got too much fuel. Too much fuel is going down here. I can't burn it all, so it's flooding it out when I turn it over. Then the last one is if I hit the throttle, if it hesitates, I don't have enough fuel down here to go up. And so there's where you enriching it just slightly. You have to have the fuel to create the power. And then the one I mentioned before, the chain, if it's turning, that's the T-screw. That was a little bit backwards. If I turn it to the right, the RPM goes up. Turn it to the left, the RPM goes down. All it does is open and close the throttle trigger. So not trying to make you into mechanics, but if you kind of see how that works, anytime you turn one of those screws to the right, you got to know what you're doing. Because either your chain's going to creep around, or you're going to end up with too much fuel or too little fuel. If I turn to the right, i got too little fuel, which means I don't have the lubrication. And so pretty soon I've got damage to the engine. Questions? One thing that uh, a lot of times here nowadays is about uh, ethanol fuels. And uh, ethanol fuel isn't a bad thing, it burns clean, but it does attract moisture. And moisture in small engines, because of the aluminum magnesium parts, it ends up causing a more or less a breakdown of the material. The thing too, it can cause things to lean out just because of the molecules are larger and it takes more of them to be able to create the power. So it's almost like everything starts running really good, but actually you're limiting the amount of fuel that it's getting when you go to higher amounts of, of uh, ethanol, which is an alcohol. Yeah, that's, the manufacturers right now, what they're saying is, try to have fuel with no ethanol if possible, but no more than 10% ethanol, because anything over 10%, you can't meter. That's the reason why the newer saws are going to the auto tunes and the Mtronics. Those will automatically meter to carry the larger volumes of ethanol because it's a larger molecule and it takes more fuel. So if you if you look at it from that standpoint, they also say get it as fresh as possible. Don't store it over 30 days. Mix it. Use a stabilizer. Now, the the Husqvarna and steel oil and the XP and XD, I think it is. Those are those are all stabilizers. If you look at the bottom of the can, it says contain stabilizer. So you don't have to add anything aftermarket. It's not bad if you do, it's just you got to really read directions because often, you know, over the years people say, I put a little more oil in the gas, you know, a little more lubrication. Well, if you put a little bit more stabilizer in, some of it goes to the oil side, some of it might go to the gas side. So you can end up running too lean of a mixture in some cases with it. So make sure you read the directions. Just don't add more because it looks good. Well, you're talking about more like the synthetic oil for the two-sided? 
Yeah, they're, they're pushing pretty hard with the synthetic mix oils and also the canned gas yeah. because it just takes away a lot of the, the yes. errors in mixing and that kinds of stuff. And plus, it, it generally because of the stabilizer in it, it'll stay fresher, it doesn't dry out or make your lines gummy, and it doesn't attract the moisture quite as bad. It doesn't phase separate, they call it, which basically it's separates the gas from the oil. Have to, uh, you got to make sure open. that you stabilize it in most cases, because it will separate pretty fast on these. That's the reason why they say don't use more than 30 days storage on it. And the biggest thing is that, you know, your cap on your equipment, it let air in so that fuel can get out. So if you leave it in your saw or your mower or whatever too long, it will pull in air which has moisture in it, and pretty soon you've got some type of a, uh, you know, chemical reaction that happens. You'll start getting that white stuff in there, so it's not good. Any other questions? Okay, good. All right. All right. So now what I want us to look at, and this should take us up to lunch, is um, thinking through putting together a plan on a standing tree. And I know y'all probably don't cut down that many trees, but uh, you do have to cut them up. So I want to start off this afternoon. We're going we're to go through dropping one tree, and then we'll look at uh, some bucking and limbing on it also as far as storm cleanup. But so many times um, people are out cleaning up roads. I, I, we get calls, you know, and they, they say, well, we don't, we don't do the dangerous stuff. We don't fell down, we don't fell trees, standing trees. We have contractors to do that or whatever. But our people just, just do the stuff that's horizontal. And I, I've said this for years, I think it's much more dangerous to cut up storm damage stuff that's horizontal than it is to fell a tree. And it's a planning process on either one. There's a lot more injuries, 10 times the injuries on cleanup operations that there are on tree felling. Not always fatalities, but more injuries that take place. So you have to have a good planning process on, on both of them. The other thing is, is that many times when you go out on a situation where a, uh, uh, a tree's across the road, you need to be aware of the whole area.